so let me first uh, say a few words about the open seminars and this year's edition. Um, this is the uh, fourth edition of the open seminars series at the Faculty of Sociology at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. Uh, this year, they are organized by the Department of the Theory and Study of Social Practices. So accordingly, uh, this year's topic revolves around the theories of practice and their use in studying important social issues. Uh, social practice theories have been developing very dynamically over the last three decades. And now um, seem, they, it seems that they have entered okay, the that mature that phase, that becoming that a fully fledged theoretical and methodological proposal. Um, they switch off their microphones. Uh, so it also seems that now it is a good time to reflect on their usefulness in research, the possibilities and valuable perspectives they afford, as well as some perhaps problems, troubles and limitations of this perspective. Uh, this year, there will be six talks, three of them in English held online and three of them in Polish held at the Faculty of Sociology in Poznan. Uh, the next one is in two weeks on January 26th, and our guest will be uh, Elizabeth Schaaf, so please stay tuned for this one. And today, our guest is Marlene Sahakian. And, uh, welcome, Marlene. Uh, Marlene is an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, um, where uh, she uses uh, sociological theories in consumption studies and sustainability. She coordinates research projects on energy, food, and well-being, and for what I know, also participates in projects on mobility, often working in uh, inter- and transdisciplinary teams. She co-founded Sustainable Consumption Research and Action Initiative Europe in um, 2012, um, and is a co-chair of the European Sociological Association Network uh, on Consumption. Uh, she also co-edits a newly launched consumption and society journal at Bristol University Press, which already has featured um, uh, interesting special issues. So um, it's worth uh, checking out. And today's talk will be about uh, sustainable consumption and social change and intervening in everyday life practices. And uh, that's it from me. And uh, just one organizational thing, 45 minutes around for the talk, and then we will have discussion for like 45 or more minutes if we like. We plan to end the latest at 7 p.m., but perhaps earlier, depending on how the discussion goes. So, um, Marvin, the floor is yours, and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you your talk. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. What a what a lovely way to start the year. And I'm grateful that the pandemic has opened up these opportunities for sharing online across geographic boundaries. Uh, so how nice to be with you today in Poznan. So I will share my screen. Do let me know if uh, you can see it in uh, full screen now. Is that fine? Yes, it's fine. Great, perfect. So, uh, indeed, I'm a scholar sitting here in a sociology department at the University of Geneva, working primarily on consumption dynamics in relation to this very broad theme of sustainable consumption. And I've been using practice theory really to think about um, uh, social practice theory as a theory of change. So as a preamble and before going into the content of my presentation, I wanted to start by saying that there are many different ways of apprehending what are social practices. Uh, here on the left, you have Pierre Bourdieu's work on social distinction, where already uh, some of uh, some ideas of social practices emerged, developed even further in his Meditation Pascalienne. You have Theodore Shatsky, who has more of a Wittgensteinian approach approach to social practices. And then more to the right, uh, scholars who have used social practice theory uh, to look particularly at everyday life dynamics, such as Elizabeth Schoff, who's coming in two weeks, 
uh, and also Alan Ward, who uses social practice theory to look specifically at consumption. So my intention today was not to give you an overview of these different theoretical strands. What I really wanted to do with today's talk is talk about the practical implications of using this theoretical framework for supporting more sustainable forms of consumption. So really understanding practice theory as a theory of habits, of routines, of uncovering what is normal and potentially also how one might use practice theory to intervene in everyday life towards social change. And that very much builds on the work that I had done uh, some years back with Harold Wilhite to try and break down practice theory into something that is, let's say, operationalized, like we could operationalize towards thinking about change. So I'm going to start with going through a series of slides that I usually present um, that I have been presenting now, I guess, for about a year or so on the limits of existing approaches to tackling the issue of sustainable consumption. I'm then going to expose different ways of using social practice theory, and then I'll conclude with some limits and opportunities of this approach, which I hope will lead into a nice discussion with all of you. So what does sociology offer and why uh, to understanding unsustainable consumption patterns and why is social practice theory relevant? So I tend to start my own work uh, and have in the past started my own work from categories or domains of consumption that are most significant in terms of environmental impacts. And there are different uh, studies that have uh, covered environmental impacts of lifestyle categories of consumption domains in different ways. And traditionally, uh, we see the most significant domains as being those related to mobility, forms of mobility that use fossil fuels, uh, including airplanes, of course. Food, what we eat, has environmental impact, especially meat and dairy products. How we use our buildings, uh, so not only the construction phase, but the usage phase of buildings for heating, for cooling, for water, is also significant in environmental terms. And increasingly, we're recognizing the high environmental impact of clothing, accessories, and textiles. So if I take these four categories and think about uh, what social theories can help us to understand these forms of unsustainable consumption. Let's start with the car. One might say that it is important to reduce private uh, transportation, and yet people like their car for comfort and for security. Uh, the car is also a symbol in, some, in, in many respects of status and prestige. And of course, Bourdieu's work on social distinction would help us understand why shifting from a car to public transport is not so easy. There are other theories that help us understand maybe more from social psychology this time that people may say that they have green values. Uh, they may recycle, they may take their bikes around, etc. But they might also express these green values by taking an exotic holiday in Thailand. And I'm being purposefully provocative with this advertisement. So there is and there can be a gap between what people say and what they do. But there's also a gap between what people do and the actual impact of their actions. Here I'm showing you an emblematic, uh, emblematic meal in Switzerland. It is the fondue based on melted cheese. I could have maybe found one for, for Poland as well. Um, uh, a meal that is uh, meat or dairy based and that is central to our traditions, our cultures, uh, this notion of terroir. Uh, and so reducing meat consumption, that other category, the second category I mentioned, is also not so evident or easy because food does have a symbolic value. Value. It is tied to rituals of consumption and of sharing, and of course to traditions that are oftentimes passed on in an intergenerational manner. So not so easy either to change the way we eat. There is a dominant um, notion in uh, sustainable consumption policy arenas, very far, I guess, away from uh, our sociology departments. And there, and it is this notion of the informed, rational decision maker that will make the best choices to uh, arrive at more sustainable consumption decisions. And here, so the idea is that the more informed I am, the better I can choose. But indeed, there is too much information available, potentially too many choices. 
no meta label that includes all aspects of sustainability. What you see here are just a few labels that we can find on food products here in Switzerland. Uh, going to the supermarket to make a sustainable choice uh, might require two hours in one single aisle trying to decipher all of the different sustainability propositions and prescriptions that are being put forward. And ultimately, these labels, while they do help inform if one is looking to make uh, a better choice. They also put a lot of responsibility on individuals uh, and may be contributing to an over-individualization of responsibility to the detriment of other decision makers upstream from consumption that also have an important role to play. And this critique of rational choice is something that you will uh, no doubt here in Elizabeth Shove's presentation two weeks from now, she has a lovely paper which challenges us to go beyond the ABC. Uh, letters that she's chosen to represent something infantile that I've, you know, that I'm representing here with these building blocks. So this idea that changing attitudes by informing people, for example, will then affect behavior and lead to certain choices is a very linear understanding of change and one that has not not seen has not seen itself to be effective I would say considering the mountains of information campaigns that we have already been subject to uh, over the past few decades around this topic of um, sustainability there is another oftentimes silver bullet solution that is proposed when it comes to more sustainable consumption and that is the idea that more efficient appliances or technologies are going to save the day and this is true according to the latest IPCC report, the six assessment report that came out uh, last spring. Indeed, we do need a considerable amount of efficiency when it comes to uh, new technologies or existing technologies, but we also need uh, sufficiency because in certain instances, better appliances understood as being uh, more efficient can lead to rebound effects. So these are some images I've taken from field work here in Switzerland on household energy consumption uh, that are part of um, reflections I had on this idea of more, bigger, better appliances. This is a middle class uh, household apartment in uh, the center of uh, Geneva with this American double refrigerator. This refrigerator has become quite standard in many households if you have the space for it, let's say, and it is probably four times the volume of the traditional Swiss refrigerator that you would have found only one or two generations ago. So appliances are more efficient, but they're getting bigger. And I'm sure Michal could say something also about cars in that capacity, that they have become more efficient, but we're seeing more and more four by four cars on the roads. The doubling in volume, uh, the doubling, doubling also in numbers of appliances. This picture is taken from a high income uh, household in Geneva, and I reassure you it has not had at, at all have become normalized. But in fact, it is really coherent with a certain way of performing the act of cooking in kitchens, which has increasingly become uh, a public space, a space for guests, where not a single spoon or dirty plate should be seen lingering on the countertop. So somehow these two uh, washing machines can contribute to keeping un dirty, undesirable uh, plates and dishes out of sight. And yet there are consequences for this kind of doubling um, of appliances or quadrupling in volume in terms of uh, energy usage. There's also this idea that if each individual can make a change, then we can change the world. And oftentimes, those, those kinds of prescriptions or calls to action do not recognize the fact that not everyone can afford or indeed have has the resources needed to engage in sustainable choices. So here are sneakers and jeans that are labeled as being part of sustainable fashion. They cost upwards of 100 euros. Of course, there are other options like buying secondhand, um, repairing, etc. But they carry with them different meanings around what is fashionable. So here, money is a resource that is an issue. But time is also an issue. And oftentimes many of the sustainable consumption prescriptions that are out there, whether it comes to canning uh, goods for the winter, using reusable diapers, growing your own food, et cetera, much of this uh, results in more domestic work. And domestic works in many of our uh, countries tend to be uh, essentially female. And so this question of care work has become increasingly um, 
prominent in sustainable consumption studies. With that introduction uh, behind us, I wanted to uh, I want to suggest that there are different myths around sustainable consumption that are really worth debunking. And of course, as you might guess, I see social practice theory as a solution uh, to overcoming these myths. So I'm very much against this idea of the individual ecological superhero who will basically recycle our way towards saving the planet. Indig individual actions. Um, are, are, are not enough. And in such this first myth, they are seen as sufficient. Social factors are oftentimes invisible. The other myth, the second one, is that we need better information and all we need is to understand in order to change our behavior. And this I have already critiqued. Um, the idea then that more efficient technologies are needed and just need to be accepted. Another uh, myth that we must uh, counter and challenge. The idea of getting the price right. Price is not only the not the only uh, indicator, and indeed um, time sometimes is a more important factor than money for many people. And finally, that everyone has the resources and skills to get involved, and this um, is not always the case. Let alone the interest. Let's say. So, with all that said. Um, we do need a theory that can help us apprehend consumption as a social activity, one that is embedded in material arrangements, which can be visible, but also less visible meanings that are nonetheless very significant. And we need a theory that can help describe everyday life, that can help us understand why people do what they do and how they do it in relation to um, different domains of consumption and perhaps also a theory that can help us think about how to design initiatives or if you, if you, I guess interventions is not a word that everyone likes, but somehow initiatives or interventions for social change towards this normative goal of more sustainable consumption. So enter social practice theory. It is for, for all of those reasons that I find social practice theory to be a very effective uh, approach, one that helps us get beyond some of those myths that I have um, just now cited. Not to say that there aren't other theories that are uh, complementary or just as valid, and I'll come back to that in my concluding words. So what is social practice theory? There are, as I've said, different theories, different interpretations of those theories. Uh, I tend to think about uh, social practice theory as a theory of routinized and or habitual activities that take place in everyday life. And it is those activities, those doings and sayings that become uh, are the object of attention, the object of our studies. Practices are recognizable. And I liked um, um, a comment by Alan Ward uh, who suggested that if you can write a guidebook about it, it's a practice. So preparing a meal is a practice, whilst perhaps frying an egg is an action that is part of that larger, more recognizable practice. Oftentimes, you will see that practices are made up of different and interrelated elements, and I'll come to that in a moment. And most importantly for this approach is the idea that people are carriers of practices. So let me give you an example of why that is significant. Uh, there may be a practice of um, uh, sharing a meal that might involve a birthday or a celebratory occasion. There might be another practice of having a meal which involves grabbing uh, a quick salad in between meetings. Those two practices can be carried by the same person. And that's what I find so interesting about this approach is that rather than looking at individuals and what they do, looking at practices uh, opens up uh, the range of um, possibilities and thinking about how different people can carry practices today or might come to carry practices in the future. Here I've uh, copied from Kirsten Graham Hansen's 2011 paper at uh, this typology that or this these different um, ways of interpreting elements of practices. Uh, so here you have Shatsky's interpretation, Alan Ward, uh, Shove uh, and Panzer's, and finally Reckrich's, and there are others. I've also worked on a different typology with um, Harold Wilhite. 
for this presentation and for much of my work, I do draw on and come and let's say augment or try to complement somewhat with some humility, let's say, the shove approach to social practice theory. So here's one interpretation drawing on Elizabeth Shove, where where I social practices are made up of interrelated elements that include meanings, competencies and things or objects. So what's interesting about this theoretical uh, framework is that those practice elements that I've just covered interrelate in a given moment and might look very differently at different might look different in different times and in different spaces. So here you see how um, uh, perhaps more traditional ways of keeping warm around a central fireplace meant that people had to also dress differently uh, whilst on the right here, you have uh, floor heating that resembles what most apartments now have or new buildings now have in Geneva. And either as a result of that um, floor heating or because of changing meanings and expectations around comfort, T-shirts are now commonly seen to be worn all year round. And maybe this is also the case uh, in Poland, although this year with the so-called energy crises, we are maybe seeing some different or some changes in practices around keeping warm. So here you see how different elements of practices interrelate in a visible way with these technologies and things, but also in less visible ways around meanings and expectations, etc. Practices interrelate over space and time. We did a study on uh, food consumption, looking at food preparation and how people provision for meals. And we found that provisioning for meal is very much related to uh, practice re practice relevant uh, mobility related practices. Sorry. So getting around from your uh, home to your uh, workplace to your school, etc also means stopping to buy certain produce along the way. And so thinking of food policies um, uh, from a practice-based approach would mean considering not only uh, questions of healthy eating or uh, what food products are available uh, in a given uh, supermarket or space, but it also means making healthy and sustainable food available at points of transit. Practices can be synchronized. They can happen at all at the same time. There have been very interesting studies on household energy consumption uh, in France, which we also, um, uh, with some similar results here in Western Switzerland, where we found that cooking takes place within a certain or similar time period across households. And this has consequences for things like um, uh, the provisioning of energy uh, and specifically energy services for cooking. Now, that framework that I presented with those three um, categories or elements of three elements of practices can have different interpretations. And I myself very much like this orange book, which I uh, happen to have on my desk today as well, which uses um, uh, social practice theory to think about interventions and social change. And in their book, which is very much written as a guidebook for uh, not only academic, but also non-academic or you know, practitioners, um, these colleagues from Estonia have suggested that social interactions could be seen as another element of practice. And these social interactions include exchanges between people in practice specific interactions, and they can be seen as integrating dynamics between material arrangements, meanings, and competencies. I've used social practice theory in this way um, with uh, stakeholders. I'll just um, uh, come to that slide in a minute, where uh, I have found it very effective to sort of draw out this question of social interactions, because even if practices are carried by people, it can be useful to think of the different kinds of people that interact and exchange around certain practices. It leads to the possibility of um, targeted interventions by looking at different actors, for example. There's another aspect of or element of practice that I wanted to maybe detail or discuss a little bit more, and that is this question of meanings. What are meanings? Because perhaps competencies or skills is something that is easier to apprehend and material things or arrangements is perhaps also a little bit more obvious. So what are meanings? 
Meanings, I see meanings as interpretations that are given to a practice, which involves understandings of what is the right or wrong way to do things, or even ideologies about what matters and why. So they translate values um, and dominant ideals in society. Although uh, Lisbeth Shav uses the word meanings, I tend to use meanings and social norms in a way, bringing social norms back into sociology away from psychology and saying that social norms uh, can lead to sanction uh, or they or, or not respecting social norms can be either tolerated or lead to sanction. And then there is something that's even harder than social norms. And these are rules and regulations that are less easy to transgress. And perhaps meanings are a little bit less fixed uh, than the latter two. And this picture is one that shows meanings around cleanliness in Switzerland. We have a saying in Western Switzerland, propre en ordre, which means to be clean and orderly. And it actually translates into being um, someone that is respectable. So cleanliness is associated with being respectable in society. And I think only in Switzerland, the, the garbage cans in the city during um, uh, the Euro and World Cup uh, have the Swiss flag on them. So uh, perhaps in other contexts where trash is not um, is, is seen in a different way, the meanings around uh, this trash bin uh, would, might be misinterpreted. But here there is a certain, uh, let's say, fierté, how do you say, proudness uh, the Swiss uh, city, apparently, uh, Geneva, in this case, is proud to show their flags on trash cans because cleanliness has such a strong value and is tied to even questions of national identity here in Switzerland. And that's something that you can't understand just by uh, necessarily observing. Uh, it is difficult also to uncover such questions around meanings uh, in short interviews or surveys. And they really do require a deeper discussion around uh, why people do what they do, what they consider to be right or wrong, and how they interpret the different prescriptions that are around them. So back to our um, overall presentation here on why practices are an interesting, practice theory is an interesting theory for thinking about change. Practices change over time, don't they? I mean, here we're looking at probably practices or illustrations of practices that are familiar to you, like uh, in, like driving a car, eating a meal, taking a shower, or choosing what clothes to wear. And these are the four categories of consumption that I showed you earlier as being very environmentally significant. And getting around, eating a meal might look very different in Poland than it does here in uh, Switzerland or in India or in Armenia or in any other country. The same practices, of course, would look very different in the past. So from horse drawn carriages as a way of getting around to communal bathing, uh, to eating uh, with your hands and maybe only a knife, to uh, maybe only having a few clothes that are used or shared uh, among others. So you can use practice theory to describe practices as they are today. And you can also use um, the theory to look at how practices have changed in the past. And therefore, you should also be able to use practice theory, and I'll give you an illustration of this a bit later, to think about how practices might change into the future. And Alan Ward says it quite nicely, that practices today already contain the seeds of constant change. So what does getting around look like? What does using water look like? Will, will food be replaced by pills? Will clothing uh, become digitalized? These are all things that we might imagine in the future in relation to changing and evolving practices. Here is the slide that I typically use when I'm trying to engage um, policymakers or practitioners with a social theoretical framework. Uh, so here you have the three elements that I had already shown, skills and competencies, meanings to which I add social rules, uh, social norms and rules, and material things and arrangements, and on the top left there, social interactions. If you take a practice such as staying cool in Manila, which is an unsustainable practice that uses air conditioning in many cases, you could then dissect that practice into these different elements of practice. And that's why I found social, why, why I found social practice theory to be quite useful. 
But although you have these buckets, you really do have to be thinking of how they interrelate and not see them as uh, sort of silos. So in terms of meanings, there are workplace dress standards that influence um, how people stay cool. In terms of material things, passive ventilation in buildings, whether it's available or not, will have an influence on how people stay cool. Skills and competencies on how to ventilate the home has an influence, and social interactions also do in relation to the workplace, uh, care responsibilities, etc. So just a few quick images from some now quite old field work that I did some years ago for my uh, PhD on cooling in Metro Manila, um, but which I've been able to update again during the pandemic to look at how cooling practices have changed over time. So here you see uh, people that are keeping cool, uh, but they are keeping cool uh, using, um, uh, on the left they are wearing a suit that probably in this tropical climate of Metro Manila would be uh, quite uh, uh, inappropriate and is only possible because of air conditioning. And even to more of an extreme on the right there, an image uh, from, let's say, the rich and famous in front of a fireplace in a tropical country, uh, communicating meanings around seasonality, meanings around what it means to celebrate Christmas, uh, drawing from imagery that uh, is more appropriate to other um, uh, climatic contexts. And here also, air conditioning is a necessity for being uh, comfortable. Cooling is very much linked to uh, material um, arrangements, specifically how buildings are built. Um, oftentimes in Manila, you will see references to architecture from elsewhere, which is illustrated in these images. The glass tower on the right is also an idea imported from elsewhere of what an ecological building must look like. And people have often said West is best when it comes to uh, architecture in that context. And this leads to lock-in effects. On the left is a building that has not been built for passive cooling, where the air conditioning unit, and here in a more symbolic and cultural reading of consumption, is put in a very prominent position. Um, and on the right there, you have someone from a low-income household who has invested in one of the first air conditioning units in their community. Um, and there also we can see and sense that air conditioning will become an increasing need. And who knows, maybe it will be the case in Switzerland also in a few years. Um, so after that description of keeping cool in Metro Manila and how it relates to meanings around comfort, material arrangements, etc., I wanted to suggest that there are ways of disrupting practices. COVID-19 was a disruption in many of our practices, and indeed there was a special issue out um, in uh, the journal Sustainability um, uh, sustainability poly it's the SSPP journal, so I know there are different journals on sustainability, um, but in that one, uh, with Mary Green and some other colleagues, we um, edited a special issue on the pandemic. And I didn't work on this topic specifically for that contribution, but it is very interesting for me to see how here in Geneva, meanings, material arrangements and competencies have changed around biking because of the pandemic. And so you can look at disruptions and you can detail also uh, how different elements of practices changed and led to new practices such as biking during COVID. And this had to do with a normalization around biking, where people came to see uh, more and more people on bikes. Uh, so I, I, uh, there is the sense that uh, seeing people do things or exchanging with others made biking more visible and more permissible. But at the same time, bike lanes were rolled out massively. Um, and of course, uh, people had access to, we are uh, we are in an affluent city here, and many people had access to uh, expensive bikes and bike gear, etc., and had the competencies already, either from having learned how to bike as uh, children um, and increasingly associated biking with health and with sports activities. So here, social practice theory is used to understand a disruption that took place and that created sort of an impetus or the favorable environment for people to take on the practice of biking. I've used social practice theory in my group to think about uh, change initiatives. 
this particular um, exercise is based and very much inspired on Tulia Jack's work. She wrote a lovely paper called Nobody Was Dirty uh, in the Journal of Consumer Culture. And I use it as inspiration to do a similar initiative here in Geneva with the Terragir Association. We handed out uh, jeans to participants. We asked them to wear them for uh, a reasonable amount of time, five days in a row for four weeks without washing them. And what we tried to do by introducing this new material thing, the gene that could not be washed, but also in moderating discussions around uh, expectations, around cleanliness and comfort, uh, we were able to get people to challenge their own normative assumptions about what it means to be clean. If for the first two weeks people were very cautious about not getting their genes dirty, in the next two weeks of the challenge, people were very relaxed and found that these reflections around cleanliness for their pair of genes had spilled over into other areas of their lives where they were also reconsidering uh, different forms of sustainable consumption, let's say. That project led to... Um, Another project called Energize, a European project where I engaged with other uh, scholars across Europe, some of whom, like Henry Rao, also work uh, with social practice theory. And here we tackled laundry, but also heating. We handed out um, challenge boxes, challenge kits around heating where very where we introduced new things like warm socks and uh, uh, um, hot teas, but it was not really the material arrangements that led to change. People themselves agreed on a target, agreed to decrease their temperatures for a certain amount of weeks and engaged in a reflexivity exercise to rethink what it means to heat bodies rather than to heat spaces. And as a result, temperatures were able to be were reduced quite significantly over the period of the challenge and continued into the follow up period some months later. There is a wonderful um, toolkit for thinking about how to intervene in practices um, uh, and also an article on the same to topic. It is called Change Points and it has come out of um, colleagues in the UK, including Claire Houlihan, Alison Brown, but also others. And they have different steps in this toolkit, which I myself have used maybe in a more, um, let's say, slightly shorter um, fashion. And uh, one first thing that can be done is to take that framework that I showed earlier with those uh, four boxes and really identify in detail what is an unsustainable practice, like taking the car, driving a car, or flying. And I've done this also with students. Once you've described those different elements and have you, once you've thought about how those different uh, elements and pra different practices might interrelate, you can then intervene in a specific what they call change point. And as part of that process, I've worked also with students and with practitioners to think about who is included or excluded from any form of change that might be suggested. So there are increasingly tools for thinking about how to use practice theory, typically through participatory processes that involve different actors to think about change. I've used practice theory in another project that is currently uh, ongoing to think about how energy scenarios might be represented in the future. The starting point for this project is that energy scenarios are very difficult for everyday people to understand and relate to. So we took scenarios for Switzerland that aim at net zero. Uh, you, know, you can critique what that means, but essentially towards net zero emissions. And we reinterpreted them into moments in the lives of people living on their way to this 2050 target. It was interesting because in a way we had to illustrate practices and describe them, but we also had to explain what changes took place before those practices could be made possible. I'd be happy to talk more about this uh, in the Q&A. What's also very interesting and important to me in this project is that the idea is not to be prescriptive about here's what the future will look like, but rather use these stories and storyboards to lead to, to lead to more reflexivity today around people's everyday lives. So it really was about imagining the future to affect the present. My current research agenda is about thinking of how human well-being as a normative aim relates to this question of environmental sustainability. So I told you earlier that I always take as a starting point those domains of consumption that are significant, mobility, food, etc. But increasingly, I've been thinking about what it means to live a good life 
drawing on different theories of human needs. And in relation to resources, what it means to have maximum or minimal levels of consumption. And that is very much drawing from a book called Consumption Corridors. And practice theory comes in here as well, because it is in thinking about practices that we realize how some needs are satisfied over others. And it's also in thinking about practices that we, we re then reflect backwards onto the material and energy resources necessary for those practices to be played out. That research agenda has uh, led me now into a, another project about engaging citizens in changing future practices in the energy transition. So very much about co-creating solutions with people through participatory approaches and thinking about what competencies, material arrangements, uh, and meanings uh, people can um, engage with and, uh, and how these people can be carriers of change. So I'm now coming to the very end of my presentation. I'm looking at the time. I think I have about five minutes left, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So Mikhail asked me to reflect on limits and opportunities. Uh, so the opportunities for me are really that practice theory, when it comes to unsustainable consumption, is a way of recognizing that any form of change is social. It is an approach that helps us deal with complexity. Although you might say, where do the boundaries of these interrelated practices end? I've been giving a lot of thought lately to practices and systems of provision in relation to practices, and that could be a discussion we can have together as well. It is a good tool or operationalizing social practice theory can be a tool that allows us to understand the past, present, and maybe also to imagine or design the future. And for sustainable consumption, it is a way of tackling directly what is normal and why, and perhaps also shaping a new normality that hopefully <laughs> could last. But there are many limits and many questions that we can open for discussion here this evening. Uh, the question of power is often one that comes up in relation to practice theory. There is this notion of agency cutting across practices, so different elements of practices might have more or less power over how that practice plays out. Um, but perhaps here a political ecology reading or political economy reading could be very complementary to a social practice approach. And that leads me to the second point. Social practice theory can be combined with other concepts or approaches, but maybe not all of them. Uh, so certainly um, um, thinking about uh, social practice theory in relation to transition theories is something that I've uh, been working on with other colleagues or bringing in a cultural reading of consumption as complementary to social practice theory. Why not with a little bit of, uh, you know, as delicately as possible, but certainly a more um, individual approach based on cognitive behavioral change would not sit well ontologically with this theoretical framework. So it doesn't do everything and it can't be combined uh, in, in every way, I would say. Uh, it is also a good framework for understanding and maybe for designing, but it doesn't tell us much about how to do social change. Uh, so there you would need to draw from other theories or other approaches based on participatory methodologies, for example. And finally, my whole presentation has been about this normative aim of sustainable consumption, to which I've added the notion of well-being, and we could also add the notion of justice, and ultimately it is a question of, you know, who gets to decide what the aim is, uh, and oftentimes when tackling this question of meanings and social norms, there is always the delicate question of uh, whether disrupting something that is normative will lead to its further in enforcement. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu already spoke about this idea that uh, contesting uh, what is normal can either lead to orthodoxy or reestablishment of that uh, sense of normal or heterodoxy. And that is something that we always must be attentive to um, and careful about. I'm going to conclude by giving you as Michal had already said, some um, uh, ideas of spaces, uh, media venues where social practice theory, consumption and sustainability tend to come together. The new journal that uh, I'm editing, co-editing with Stefan Wallen and Daniel Welsh, uh, very much looking forward to contributions coming from uh, Poznan. Uh, Score EU, which you're welcome to join. It is um, uh, an open platform where we share um, different information around sustainable consumption, but also teaching resources. 
and RN5, which is the research network on the sociology of consumption within the European Sociological Association. Maybe some of you are already members. And there, there is also the RN12 on environment and society. I've provided all my cited reference and I'll send the slides along to Miha later. Thank you so much for your attention. And now I look forward to your uh, questions and our discussion. Thank you very much, Marlene, for the wonderful presenta presentation. Um, the, the, the last points you had about uh, opportunities and limitations, they resonate very well with the discussions that we've been having in our department. So I'm, I'm hoping for an interesting discussion uh, after the talk. And um, so I guess now it's the time to open it up. Um, so if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please raise, use the, the this feature of raising a hand and um, um, and then please speak and I will try to moderate the discussion. OK, Philippe. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, raise some questions that you actually uh, raised at the very end of your presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, first, I wanted to to ask about this uh, um, on, about uh, applying the the social practice theory to practices that are not performed by so-called ordinary people. Uh, if we have to explain the, the complexity of, of, of different uh, phenomena, uh, the persistence, uh, don't we also need to include the uh, um, creation and maintenance of these meanings, competences, materiality, etc., by um, simultaneously studying practices of people who create documents, uh, practice traffic management, for example, in relation to this example of mobility, uh, create advertisements, uh, wage war in Ukraine, which impacts the fuel price, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If if so, do you know examples of such research, which seems very labor intensive, with very difficult, that that, that successfully uh, treats uh, social practices in everyday life as social practices, but also practices of 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 um, uh, uh, of other in, in t taking place in other institutions from this point of view. And in relation to that, uh, I wanted to ask you about the evolution of your thinking, writing about social practices between this uh, article from 2014 that you started with and today in particular about this, uh, your in increased interest in, in multi-level perspective theories. Do you think it is useful or even necessary to combine them? And uh, what does such a combination look like you know, on the level of research again, exam research methodology example of of successful research. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Um, uh, so first of all, this idea that practice theory has been used to look mostly at everyday dynamics, consumption dynamics in the home, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that it can't be used to look at other instances um, uh, such as those that you describe. I tend to think Think, I, I tend to take consumption as a starting point because that's my domain and my interest. Uh, and then I sort of try to pull out to look at uh, what some authors have called systems of provision. So these systems of provision um, uh, have been uh, theorized by Alan Ward in a certain way, but also uh, by people like uh, Ben Fine. And um, he indeed has a keyword essay in the first issue of Consumption Society on this topic. Uh, I find it useful to distinguish the two, um, to think about consumption dynamics and then working back to see what systems of provision allow for some consumption dynamics to take place over others. And this has real consequences for sustainability because uh, the aim is not for people to choose to engage in a sustainable pr practice, but for systems of provision to make sustainable practices more available over non-sustainable ones. Um, but then when you come to when it comes to analyzing a systems of provision, you could look at it through a social practice framework. Uh, 
and there are people who have been doing some of this work. There's a lovely article on um, on banking by um, Jill Seifang and uh, a colleague, Gilbert Squires. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the second name. I can find the reference for you. Um, but in fact, what they do is they bring social practice theory and the multi-level perspective together. And we've done um, with Margit Keller a bit of a literature review on the possibility of combining these two approaches. And we start with a big disclaimer that says, OK, uh, for some people, social practice theory is flat. There is in that ontology, there is no uh, question of um, uh, levels or scales. Uh, but actually, Frank Gilles himself, in revising his own concept of the multi-level perspective, has said that these are not um, levels. These are rather um, uh, different points of integration, I think he calls them. But in that one article by Sei Fang and her colleague, they bring together social practice theory and the multi-level perspective quite effectively to say that um, you can use practice theory to understand a regime level, for example. You can use practice theory to think about teleaffectivities that might be at this more landscape level. And you can certainly use practice theory to see how niches are emerging. But perhaps bringing practice theory into these uh, levels or layers or however you want to call them adds more nuance or more complexity to that framework, whilst the multi-level perspective brings to social practice theory a greater notion of dynamics and potentially power structures that might be different from the niche to the regime to the landscape level. So I think this is a big conversation, a really interesting conversation, but um, the the uh, I don't know if I put it in my in my references, the literature review we did on MLP and, and uh, social practice theory, but if not, uh, I'll add it. And I would say my starting point is consumption, but there are other people who are using practice theory to look at healthcare systems, you know, other domains, and maybe that's where we should also look to be inspired um, and to have um, to pay more attention to systems of production, systems of provision that underlie consumption practices. I hope that answers the question somewhat. Or maybe you want to add or to that your own reflections or I think we have a lot of time so. <laughs> Now, maybe I would just ask uh, in your domain, in the consumption domain, uh, do you do uh, no, about uh, combining this, this research uh, in the household, so to say, or with people uh, doing their everyday practices and uh, people who create or, or reproduce change conditions for, for these things to, to, to happen? For example, uh, like uh, creating these products or. Um, yes. uh, regulations in the consumption domains that you studied uh, with, with, with uh, in everyday life do, do you Absolutely, do you, yeah. mm -hmm. i mean for the, the examples that i gave of cooling in the philippines i was going over them quite quickly but clearly um the um hvac ventilation industry clearly the architects clearly the building developers uh, the the media partners that communicate a certain image of what a modern house looks like, all of those people and the practices that they carry need to be the center of our interest when it comes to changing um, the dependence on um, on artificial cooling in Manila. So I think depending on the domain that you're looking at, the the different elements of practice that might be more significant, might vary. So infrastructures might be more important for heating, cooling and mobility, whilst meanings and social norms may be even more important for food consumption. And every time you get into one of those um, uh, elements of practice, you would then pull back to look at the systems of provision that underlie them, I would say. I hope I, had, I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, the next question was um, is going to be asked by Przemysław. Thank you, Marlene, for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, two short questions, and the first is yours question, uh, because I, I, I very like uh, your, let's say, question about uh, dealing with the complexity, because this, this is also our question. We are also thinking about that. And I, I would like to ask you about, let's say, your experience or your tips 
uh, about to uh, setting the limits of in research of investigation uh, where should be put the boundaries because I, 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 I can imagine that uh, when we are doing the research on heating or using energy it's like the, the network can going farther and farther so so share share uh, with us your experience please and the second question is uh, about the do you think that there are such kind of uh, social phenomena which are not very good to be investigated by uh, practice theory by using in, in terms of practice theory that it doesn't you know combine uh, with each other thank you Great, thank you for your two questions. I'm going to answer the first one a bit indirectly because your question made me think of another point that I that I find is is uh, quite important. And that is that in a way, whatever the way you frame a problem is going to lead to some solutions being privileged over others. So as, essentially, if you frame a problem as being a problem of unfit technologies or a problem of people not behaving well, then the solutions you're going to propose are going to be about bringing in new technologies or changing behavior. And I think that's where this idea of social practice theory bringing in complexity is relevant because social practice theory demands that you go beyond changing individuals or changing technologies to think about changing practice elements or changing how practices interact. And it is that starting point that then leads to more uh, interesting and diverse and yes, complex, uh, possibly complex solutions, uh, but these silver bullet solutions are not effective, um, not always effective, let's say, in and of themselves. Setting the limits always depends on the resources and the interests that you have in a given topic. Um, I would say social practice theory helps uncover complexity, but then you can certainly zone in and focus in on a specific aspect of an unsustainable practice um, and try to, you know, uh, further understand the meanings around uh, keeping cool or riding a bike, etc. Um, and then the other question was about um, social phenomena. Can you remind me what was the... Um, whether yeah, there's some some things that you can't investigate. Well, of course, yes. I mean, every theory will be applicable to um, the relevant research question or inquiry. Uh, I've used other theories to look at things like the cultural meaning of air conditioning units or the symbolic uh, value of certain meals. And there I've drawn from material culture uh, studies. So you Practice theory isn't useful for everything, and different theories um, can be brought to bear. What I was saying at the end of my presentation is that you cannot combine theories that are completely ontologically distinct. So I think you can bring the multi-level perspective and social practice theory together with some disclaimers over this idea of flatness or not, etc. But I don't think you can combine a more cognitive, rational behavior approach with a social practice theory approach. That's what I was saying. And that's often something that that uh, that tends to come up because there is there is such a dominant, I, I guess there is a normative um, uh, training around um, individual behavior change or more cognitive approaches that tend to dominate much of the, the teaching curricular maybe around consumption studies, not in our departments, but maybe elsewhere. And so it's difficult sometimes for people to let that aside and try and engage in a different approach that takes away the, the focus from individuals themselves or tries to break with this dichotomy, let's say, between individual and structure. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Okay, I see that Paul is raising hand. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for your presentation. Uh, I'm working on uh, sustainable consumption uh, using social practice theory as well, um, and all this works quite well for me when it comes to um, just analyzing the status quo of how practices 
constitute uh, in, in everyday life. But then I have uh, problems um, thinking about a social change. And when yeah. you showed uh, your examples, I was a bit confused uh, because I cannot really understand the essence that differentiates your uh, approaches, giving a box with informational material and a challenge uh, compared to um, interventions, interventions that come from the psychological departments. You have an eco label uh, and you have some learning material and then practice theory says, or as Schroff said it in the Beyond the ABC paper, uh, all the over individualized approaches uh, don't work for big transitions. But, yet, but then you uh, provided some examples that at the first glance uh, seem quite similar. Uh, so I want to know what, what is the what is the difference here in, in its essence? Well, you must have been a reviewer on one of my papers. <laughs> that question does, <laughs> that question comes up. Definitely. I went over them quite quickly. I guess there are two ways to answer that question. The first is that whatever we did in Energize and whatever we did could probably be explained with psychological theories. I don't know. Like they could be explained with, with any number of theories. It just so happened that we designed the change initiative with a social practice theory in mind. So our way of thinking about the change initiative was to say, we need to change competencies, we need to challenge meanings, we need to introduce new material arrangements, and we need to understand better those different elements and how they interact. To the point about um, uh, are these not very individualized approaches, Energize had two ambitions. It was to test a more, let's say, individual household driven approach with a more collective approach. So we recruited in two ways. We recruited households individually. Some were, few were single households, many were families. And then we recruited buildings or people in similar communities of um, place. And we tried to compare what, what a more collective approach might look like. But at the end of the day, even if we touched 300 households across Europe, it is a very insignificant amount of people uh, when we think about the scale of change needed. And that's why I myself turned a little bit away from looking at these more household consumption dynamics to reflecting on forms of collective action and citizen engagement in uh, the energy transition. But even if we go back to Energize in that project, I would say one of the most effective parts of that change initiative was not what was going on at the household level. It was the media attention that came around it. So here in Geneva, we had um, a, a TV crew follow one household throughout their challenge, and that household got prime media time. And in that prime media time, expectations around what it means to be clean and what it means to be comfort uh, comfortable were given a bit of space in public discourse so now you're saying oh well this is about changing public discourse it's no longer about changing practices well true it is about looking at meanings and then what we did after this energized project is that we realized that there were limits to how people could keep warm in relation to material arrangements. Here in Switzerland, because of uh, floor heating systems that use hydraulic valves, people do not have the capacity to act on their heating systems. In fact, there is no heating practice. It is very much automated. And that was a policy message we were able to deliver. And we were able to then work back to uh, building owners, building managers, and explain that this ability for people to reduce their heat um, was, um, was, was not apparent and needed to be rethought. So it's not a, a perfect answer, but I actually I do have one more bit of answer that I wanted to give you. To me, if I could summarize how social practice theory contributes to change, I would say it has something to do with reflexivity and it has it has something to do with creating spaces and times where people can experiment with new ways of doing 
Now, what was interesting during the pandemic is that these new ways of doing were imposed because of uh, confinement measures. And when that imposition was lifted, people went back to normal. So now what I'm curious and interested about is how do people then, why do people who may have changed a habit for 20 days or 30 days or however long a confinement lasted, why do they go back to old ways of doing? And I think this is a this is an open question. And somehow there is something here about individual and collective reflexivity that is worth um, picking at or thinking about. What do you think, Paul? <laughs> I, I really don't know. Um, I'm a. I have a background in mechanical engineering, so I have to dig deeper here. Uh, um, Good for you for using social practice theory, and I yeah. would love to learn more about your work. Yeah, I'm I'm working on on a way to environmentally assess consumption patterns. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing a life cycle assessments, yeah. and I question myself. Okay, when I want to assess consumption patterns, what is consumption? Right. So yeah. I read about consumption and I came to social practice theory. I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I mean, this question of what is consumption is a big issue because there are, it, consumption can include everything. So how do you limit yourself? It goes back to one of the questions we heard earlier. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for your answers. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the great questions. I think Marta has her hand yeah. up, if I'm not mistaken. Hi, Marta. Hi, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. I think you partly answered my question uh, just <laughs> before a moment, but I think this would be a chance to elaborate maybe, uh, because I had a question about putting uh, practice theory into practice um, and uh, the met methodological kit that you use. Because uh, I was thinking, and we were thinking actually in our department lately, we were discussing a methodology in practice theory. And we concluded that the complexity of practices is often reduced in uh, the social research, uh, for example, by using the traditional methods of, uh, that sociology uh, often used, like surveys and uh, individual interviews. And um, I think mostly instead of following a practice and investigating practice, we actually investigate what people um, say about their practices. So yeah. we only have their declarations. I think you started uh, discussing your your method saying about um uh, researching uh, households uh, but um, my question would be maybe for more examples about how to uh, find some inspiring and new ways um to see practice in its complexity um yes. with using new methods maybe some experiments thanks yeah. yes great question yeah so um the 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 I guess the traditional approach has been to use in-depth qualitative methods. Um, and I oftentimes start with a question around habitual ways of doing. So not asking why people do things, but asking people to describe their da daily life. And I've used before and found quite interesting the, um, uh, uh, the possibility of injecting in those in-depth conversations different forms of photo elicitation. So taking images and asking people to react to them. So these were very useful, uh, both for the Energize project and my other project on household energy consumption. Often we hear, you know, household energy is uh, invisible to people. It doesn't have a lot of meaning, although now that that is all probably changing with the current geopolitical context. But I wanted in those projects to tackle some normative assumptions around um, uh, everyday tasks or chores that use energy. And the best way I found of doing that was to show images. And I think this is something Talia Jack has done as well on her work with cleanliness. So showing images that represent, you know, old advertisements um, of um, cleaning uh, clothes 
or images around um, you know, people wearing t-shirts indoors in the winter and asking people to react to those and discuss what they find is normal or not normal. So photo elicitation is a good method. Another interesting method is um, uh, walking interviews in people's homes. Strangely, Zoom facilitated this a little bit where you could have interviews with people over Zoom who would walk you around and show you different things. And this was useful, particularly to understand um, the what people understand to be normal levels of appliance acquisition. So I would go into households that would say, oh, we don't really have a lot of uh, appliances. We don't use a lot of energy. And yet the American fridge was there. Everyone in the household had a flat screen TV, you know, so it was it's interesting to go on location and to investigate also to be able to open cupboards, to be able to uh, talk through um, the things that people have and how they've acquired them and how they've come to not use them anymore or repair them, etc. I've seen some and I myself have tried to use quantitative methods with practice theory. The way I've done that is I've um, I, I first did in-depth qualitative research and then I drew out of those interviews statements that to me were quite representative of certain findings and I would ask people whether they agreed or not with certain statements. So one statement that came out of uh, the project on, on uh, cleanliness was, uh, for, I'll try and translate from, for French, from French it was, uh, for me to feel good, my house needs to be in good order, something like that. I came directly out of an interview uh, and really says a lot about people's sense of well-being around uh, cleanliness and orderliness. And I use that to to then um, uh, uh, substantiate how many, what percentage of people of the Swiss population agreed or disagreed uh, with that statement. But I think there are some resources on interesting methods or new methods um, um, there is a wonderful book called Mundane Methods. I, I'll see if I can add it to my slides when I send them. And these mundane methods capture things like um, uh, soundscapes or you know different different approaches. Uh, and I'll try and I'll try and share those with you. Journals are another good one, by the way. I've used journals before. Maybe those are. Or do you have any ideas for me? Maybe you also have some innovative ideas that you've thought about that you can share. Thanks. I, I must say I also like photo elicitation very much and I used it and I think with good results um, and journals as well. I think they're good, uh, but they demand a lot of work from people. <laughs> so this might be a problem sometimes. And generally, this is a problem, I think. And the research that we designed that we need a lot of time and money and people's effort and willingness to participate if we want uh, them to engage that much, uh, like, in you know, walking and and photographing and keeping yes. their diaries and everything else. Yes. Uh, yes, I was actually thinking about um, giving a task as as a method. I was thinking about like um, presenting a problem to solve or, or just giving a task, a little task to do, like what would you do in such situations and how would you behave? But not only as a theoretical thing, but more of a like a real task to do to observe what people do and more observation in general because we only talk about things but we i think we don't observe that much what people actually do in in certain yeah. contexts yeah so yeah yeah and big data is probably making those observations more easy to access so mo data on mobility data on you know there's so much on food consumption there is a lot of this I feel like there's some combination of big data and ethnographic research that needs to sort of come together and yeah you know, and, and and no doubt it's it's already underway yeah yeah it's also, it's like switching environments is also very good and like giving people um like a situation they wouldn't ever uh yeah. like um you know, find themselves in, in other circumstances and that yes. maybe yeah. Yeah, give them something to think. I was also yeah. thinking about something else, by the way, because uh, I noticed during our discussion that we use a lot uh, of the word context. So we yes. say that political context, economic context and other contexts and the context of the war. And I think that maybe you presented this four element grid of, I, I can't remember everything, but 
these were you know the uh, the skills and the um, and the norms yeah. and everything else. But I think maybe we also need an element of context because we used um, this term anyway. What do you think? Well, all of it is a social practice is always embedded in a specific sociocultural setting, a specific historical uh, continuity. I think some people don't like the word context necessarily, but it is, I think all social practices are embedded in it's something you can't take them out of context let's say um one other just quick idea that came to mind is i didn't maybe didn't say it explicitly but living labs are another great way to experiment with changing practices this goes with what you were saying of changing context if you give people this space of experimentation you tell them to do something differently or you give them new things to try out or you give them um, the chance to come up with a new rule of their of a game in everyday life. That also it's what we did with with energize, and um, it also can lead to some interesting uh, results. Can I ask how many people um, participated in this lab? In Geneva, we had forty participants, and across Europe, we had three hundred. And now I'm doing another living lab here in Geneva based on this idea of the energy transition. And the format is a little bit different. It started with a core group and there's a snowball approach where more and more people are joining. So overall, we've reached maybe 120 people experimenting mm -hmm. with new forms of citizenship is the idea. But they tend to be quite small living labs. And at the next SCORI conference, which is taking place in Vaneningen, uh, in July, I have a special session with Julia Backhouse on living labs specifically and how we can evaluate the impact of living labs with the idea of scaling or replicating or amplifying or however you want to call it. Yeah, again, it's, you know, we can be criticized for for doing research that touches only few people, but it's how we amplify the results of what they've done or how they how that leads to other ideas or projects that becomes interesting, oftentimes beyond the scope of our funding cycles. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, we're also <laughs> discussing the uh, the living lab lately. I'm I'm not experienced in that, but I'm very much interested. So probably Miha will can, will also uh, tell you about it because he's the um, uh, leader of the project uh, that oh, I'm also please. a part of. Yes, and we're thinking about this as well. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Marta. I look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about chalk and cheese, the uh, the, the psychologically derived theories of attitude and behavior and, um, and social practice theory. Uh, the question you mentioned that was included in the survey really could have uh, been included in a uh, psychologically informed question, uh, questioner about attitudes, and sometimes, um, especially in the in the field of mobility, the attitudinal questions are could be said that they are about meanings that people associate with specific uh, travel modes or or traveling in a certain way, vacationing, and so on. So um, even though uh, these um, uh, these questionnaires and the projects come from different theoretical traditions, maybe use a bit different vocabulary. Very often the, the things they study are very similar. And in mobility context, there is built environment, there are norms, there are attitudes, and sometimes also like interactions between, uh, you know, you, you travel to do something. So this is like interactions between practices. So how much these um, these two uh, approaches are are really uh, um, in you know not possible to 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 combine um, and uh, and just to just to clarify I, I'm not I'm not talking about rational models I'm mostly yeah. talking about what is like when the A B C the C is not choice but the context and it's like kind of embedded in you know, whatever is not attitude and sure. behavior, that there can be can be anything, and they yeah. are these theories don't really assume always like the rationality and acting according yes. to the knowledge and so on. So, what is your what is your take on on, yeah. on that? I mean, you have to ask Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shaw these questions in two weeks. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd be I'd be glad to sit in on that as well. Um, 
as I was saying before, it is a different problem framing is going to lead, brings with it different assumptions and will lead to different solutions. So I really believe if you are if you are fixed on changing a technology or changing individual behavior, however you go about it, no matter what theories you're bringing to changing individual behavior, that will lead to a certain outcome. Whilst changes in practices um, would lead to another type of outcome. That's maybe the simple answer. The more complex uh, answer I could give you is, um, I am, and maybe I should vent a little bit because I am, I, I do work with uh, social psychologists. I agree with you. It's not always about rational behavior. It's about uh, heuristic devices that people use. It's about social influences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, surveys that are used in that capacity tend to draw from existing scales. And those scales, because they've already been published, will continue to be used and be replicated because they're somehow valid. Um, I can't tell you the number of surveys I've looked at that use language that I find highly moralistic and problematic. If you come up with a statement like I've, the one I, example I've given, um, to be uh, to feel good, I need a clean home. Do you agree or disagree? It's very different than from some of the statements that you tend to see in these more psychologically oriented surveys that say things like, I feel ashamed to be dirty. I've seen that in a survey or, you know, so uh, I guess I'm in general not a big fan of surveys. I've used them mostly to try and substantiate um, how habits play out. So how many people are engaged in one routine over another? And I've used them to sort of substantiate certain meanings around practices, like how important is it for people um, to have a clean home, etc. But it doesn't get us to other questions like why, in what way, how is that tied to um, different material arrangements? I want to say maybe that it's not my intention, or maybe it shouldn't be anyone's intention to convert people away from social psychology into social practice theory. It just so happens that this is a theory that I've come to use that I find is useful. Um, it has its limits and maybe other theories could be just as useful for you in your mobility stu studies or what have you. Um, but they do, they cannot be mixed either. You see, you can't, you know, you can't, um, uh, assume that you want to change practices and then end with a behavioral change campaign. In fact, this exercise with the four buckets that I do with students to identify elements of practices that are unsustainable, they must then come up with an intervention. Because we have a short amount of time, I tell them you are not allowed to come up with a new technology and you are not allowed to come up with an information campaign. Find something else, <laughs> come up with another solution, anything else. And that really pushes them to think more seriously about practices and how elements interrelate to get beyond this general assumption that it's just about um, changing behavior. But I would, you know, Mihai, I'd love to hear more about this, how social context is brought into social psychology theories. It's just not my, it hasn't been my uh, disciplinary baggage to date. <laughs> Yeah, I think it seems to me that uh, sometimes the point of confusion is the use of the word behavior. It is often used, uh, you seem to uh, be using it and, and, and similarly to Elizabeth Schaff in like rather n narrow way that uh, when, when you know, someone aims to change a behavior, it means that they want to change what people do, how they live using behavioral theories, whereas I think many people who who do research, for instance, on travel behavior, they understand behavior as as what people do observe observable action, you know, driving, uh, flying, yeah, and not necessarily uh, using behavioral uh, theories yeah, or interventions exactly. to change, and and yeah. maybe that is like one one of the points of of confusion because uh, many many of the studies on, on on travel behavior actually take into account like many they, they don't use social social practice theory but often right. all the elements are present but it's just a, you know a different ontology different names of four things and so on I, yeah and i guess behavior is so much more established as a word 
I, how many European proposals um, have the word behavior in them? And if you want to go in and change it all to practices, people get up in arms. I mean, it's just I find practices more effective, even when I'm talking to policymakers. I get what you're saying, but in fact, getting people to talk about practices puts them in another disposition. It does take a little bit of attention away from individual um, choice. And we, since you know the 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 uh, you know since since the new neoliberal era, the individualization of responsibility has become so prominent that any approach for me that tries to deflect attention away from behavior, even if you're saying it has this broader meaning, to think about practices is, is useful. But yeah, I mean, the, in the article by Hal Wilhite, we look at three practices and we, we analyze how um, uh, a campaign to, um, to promote tap water in the UK, we analyze um, a program a weight loss program in Oklahoma City. At no time in those two cities did anyone say, we're gonna put in place a practice-based approach to change, right? They probably were working with behavior change or what have you. So it's what lenses you use to analyze a given uh, context or situation and what those lenses bring that you might not get um, elsewhere. Um, and sometimes I do find that behavioral approaches really do uh, end up um, moralizing individuals. I mean, this, sur I read survey questions and I don't understand how people don't think that those questions are influencing the the ad the attitudes that people have towards a given topic or question. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, that was my complaint. <laughs> that's uh, that's very uh, that's very possible that they do influence. Just 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 the thought that you know moral. Uh, moral um feelings and 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 uh um morality is a part of the meaning right so it's a it's a question of like how to elicit it how to know what moral meanings people uh, associate like social norms are also about morality so it's it's a tricky one thank you very much and and alexandra is raising yeah. uh, a hand yeah. hi alexandra <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. And I would like to focus on the notion of reflexivity that you also mentioned, um, like as initiating social change, as I understood it from your presentation. Um, I'm also working or I'm looking at the role of um, reflexivity in practices, um, to change practices, to adapt practices, and in the end to foster social cohesion. And um, I was wondering, so in my research, I'm so at the point that I think reflexivity is helpful, but it's not uh, necessary. And there are other elements that might be even more necessary. And I was wondering if you have any insights on that. So, for example, I'm now looking at uh, personal capabilities, skills, basically, like um, social skills, but also other type of skills. And um, I also realized that reflexivity is like because it's mostly in my case at least on um uh, so that it's uh, on the level of communication and what people are reporting and thinking so it's more on the sayings level but on the doing mm -hmm. level there is a whole different story so this gap is also a bit irritating for me yes yeah so maybe you have any insights on that i was wondering yeah it's a, it's a good question um i mean ultimately the, the the example that I gave around the COVID pandemic, I think, is very telling because uh, on the one hand, you could say people should engage in reflexivity and they should um, uh, therefore question their notions of comfort, cleanliness, etc. On the other hand, change can be imposed. And when that change is imposed, it's also quite effective. Um, there is going to be over the next uh, one or two months a study on energy usage uh, in Europe. I'm part of it. Um, Melanie Yeager, Kirsten Graham Hansen, different people. And, and if anyone from Poznan would like to join, I'm sure you're more than welcome to really be thinking about how new meanings today around energy provisioning in Europe might be influencing how people um, heat their homes this winter. And ultimately, that will also depend on the material arrangements that um, that privilege certain forms of consumption over others. So I think this I'm torn. On the one hand, reflexivity needs to happen at the level of people and groups and social groups and everything, but maybe it also needs to happen 
um, towards a new social contract, you know, like actually that that is why this is why on the one hand, I have all this work on consumption corridors, which is quite conceptual, but which is about with Doris Fuchs and others, which is about thinking of upper and lower limits to consumption um, and the satisfaction of human needs within those consumption corridors. Because to me, there's almost there's a new discourse that we need to have on what it means to live a good life sustainably. Um, and that's not something that's going to happen at the level of individual reflexivity, but needs to happen on a on a broader scale. We can be uh, visionary and uh, optimistic, I guess, if we if we if we still can, if we still have the energy for that. Um, I liked what you were saying about personal capabilities and social skills. I think um, it's what I was trying to get at with this idea that social interactions are really important also in practices, how people interrelate. And then there is this merging now a little bit of social practice theory with um, human needs approaches to well-being or even capability approaches to well-being. So what does it what capabilities do people need to have to live a good life? Um, and that is something that I'm convinced must not be um, managed at an individual or local level. Indeed, societies need to be able to allow uh, people to meet their needs or develop capabilities in certain ways. And maybe that sort of brings me back to this question of um, um, participatory methods, which I mentioned a little bit in my presentation. It seems pretty obvious, but it was one of these aha moments for me where I realized that participation is a human need, actually, and that somehow engaging people in one way or another is part of what it means to live a good life. I don't know. That's a, that's quite some some conceptual stuff I've thrown out there. But um, yeah, and then what you were saying about this gap between sayings and doings is is very clear. And that's why challenging saying sometimes through photo elicitation, these kinds of um, moments can be can be interesting. But I'd love to hear more about your work also. Wow, there's a lot of great work happening there in your department. Or where are you actually? You're not, in, are you also in uh, Poznan yourself or? No, I'm based uh, or working in Wuppertal at the time. Ah, you're at Wuppertal, of course. Okay, all right, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. Yeah, thank you. Also. Hey, are there any other questions? Okay, Paul. Um, yeah. Uh, one more, I think, very basic question. I hope it's somewhat easy to answer. Uh, on your very first uh, slide, I think, you were showing us uh, four uh, works from Bourdieu and Chauv and yeah. Chatsky and so on. And you introduced some basic perspectives um, that we can use uh, to work on sustainable consumption. And for me, Bourdieu was very special here because um, this distinction approach means the people tend to do something different, while the other uh, perspectives show us um, that people um, maintain their habits, uh, they don't want to change, they eat the cheese fondue every year because it's their culture, but the distinction means I do something different every time. My, every car gets bigger or, or different or my traveling uh, changes because uh, now everyone's going to Japan, so I visit uh, some other uh, yeah. destination. So they, I feel like they describe um, the opposite of each other. Yeah, um, well, this is where your engineering background is starting to. <laughs> and actually, I have a development studies background, so I'm not even a real sociologist sitting here either. Um, actually, in that book, uh, uh, Sur la distinction sociale, it is the notion of habitus that is um, fundamental. Um, habitus is a set of dispositions. And later in Meditation Pascalian, he even goes further in his theory of, of habitus in relation to social practices. And even if distinction for you may seem like a, the way you describe it, an action or 
um, uh, a moment in consumption it is actually a form for Bourdieu of social reproduction um, that is not at all individualized. It is tied to certain fields and certain rules and certain ways of doing which make people uh, develop a sense of taste that they feel distinguishes themselves from others, but is very much caught up in um, the habitus and social reproduction that happens in similar social classes for Bourdieu and over generations. But I put I put those authors there. I could have added Rekvich. Um, you know, there are other people, um, Anthony Giddens and his theory of structuration. I just wanted to start off by saying that, you know, we're walking on the shoulders of giants here and uh, that I was not necessarily going to cover the details of each theoretical approach, but rather how I use it and how I hope it could be useful to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, it seems that um, no one is raising their hand, so we can wrap it up. Thank you very much, uh, Madeline, for the for the presentation and for for inviting our uh, for uh, accepting our invitation. And thank you for everyone for participating in the discussion. Um, I hope to stay uh, in touch with uh, with you, those uh, guests from from outside our department. And um, uh, I welcome you to join uh, the next uh, open seminar in two weeks with Elizabeth Schaff, where we will be continuing the topic, uh, I guess, um, uh, with um, somewhat similar and perhaps somewhat different angle. Um, so yes, thank you very much and uh, uh, have a good rest of the evening and, and see you next time. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was great discussing with all of you. Thank you. Take care. I hope we keep in touch. Mm -hmm.